I know AI is a little bit overhyped right now, but hear me out. The last couple of years have been pivotal in the way we, the humans, talk to the machines. We are transitioning from UI, user interface, to HI, human interface. And that is bringing transformational changes to the way we build and use productivity applications. And the opportunity is huge. Let me explain. By now, thanks to OpenAI and others, we are all aware that we can have a relatively informative, human-like conversation with the machines. The cool thing is that we can talk in any language, human or programmatic, or even media files, and the machine can respond to us in any of those languages or media files. Now, where it gets interesting for application is that we can talk in a human language and ask the machine to answer in code. One use case is to learn how to code. But another use case is to translate a natural language into calls to our server and database. This is typically called function calling and is one way to enrich conversations with application data. But the same technique can also be used to enhance existing applications or create new specialized applications. And that is because not all AI interactions have to come from a chat app. In fact, if we step back, we can identify three types of application AI integrations, AI chat, AI widget, and AI app. In the first case, AI chat, let's say that the user asks, give me the year to date KPIs. The AI can translate this into code instructions that match our application APIs, so we can run it and get the data from the application backend. Then the AI can format this data for the final presentation. The server can even ask the AI to generate some additional code to create charts. And that is what we currently have in OpenAI Chat. The second type is the AI widget, which is less common today, but will likely become more prevalent. For the same request, the AI follows the same logic. It gives the instructions. We run them on our server to get the data. But now, instead of displaying the static content, we can display an interactive component as some interactions might be more efficient with UI elements. And because not all user interactions need to be shared based. And the last one is the other way around. We have a full features application with advanced UI elements like data grids and their controls. And then we have our human interaction elements, which can take a human request like show me the outliers. We'll run those instructions and dynamically change the UI. And then it can even propose follow-up actions as UI elements like extract. This is a simplistic example, but the point is that here we have chat in the app rather than app in the chat. And in fact, if we zoom back, we have a spectrum. At the bottom, we have our traditional UI-only applications. And at the very top, we have our chat-only app. Then middle top, we have our AI widget, which is our UI within the chat. And below, our AI app, which is chat within the UI. And the way collective learning typically operates is with an amortized sinusoidal curve, where cycles of overdoing some patterns eventually narrow down to the better solution. And this curve is pretty generic. For example, we could apply it to mainframe at the bottom and PC only at the top, and we will observe a similar pattern. Now, the trick is that we cannot really bypass the whole process, as it is always a resonance between the consumers and the producers of the technology. However, the opportunity is to optimize this curve to minimize the overshoots, which then allow us to be where the perk will be rather than following it. Now, if we look at the backend side, we have three main challenges, processing, storage, instructions. On the processing side, whether we use OpenAI, Google services, some open models via Olama on AWS or some AWS services, these interactions will require much more processing power. So first, if we do it in-house using some open models, we will need a robust and scalable processing cloud architecture, which will impact cost. And even if we use third-party services, there will be a significant extra cost per request. Another aspect of the processing side is that the time per request response will increase dramatically. In a database-only realm, subsequent response time have become the norm. But now with AI requests, even those are getting a little bit faster, we are more in the multi-second range. Now, the good news is that OpenAI has already educated the users, so the expectation has been set. 
Now, on the storage front, in addition to our application database and data storage, we now need vector databases because users expect semantic search. For example, when we search for scooter, we also want to find bicycles. And the way vector databases work is that they store the meaning of text in vectors, also known as embeddings. A vector has a fixed length called dimensions, typically represented by a four byte floating point numbers that capture the meaning of text chunks. For example, with nomic embeddings, vectors can have up to 768 dimensions with a 8K context, meaning each vector can capture the meaning of six to 8,000 words. However, the trick is that a search request can only be performed on vectors of the same dimensions. So if we want to have the same dimension for all text chunk, regardless of their size, for a small text, for example, 50 words, while it takes only 360 bytes on disk, about, the vector will take three kilobytes. Now, the good news is that if we have 3000 words, which will fit very well into the 8K context, the text will take about 19 kilobytes on disk, but the vector, since it has the same dimensions, will still be only three kilobytes. So one sensible technique is to use different vector sizes for different types of data and architect our applications to make multiple requests. There are also promising activities right now to quantize the vectors, where we only have one bit per dimension, which is a huge gain, but this needs to be applied correctly. Regardless of the strategy, storage cost and management will increase as well, even if it's not as much as the processing side. And the time per request will also increase, but this could still be subsequent if scoped and managed correctly. Now, the true power comes from the instructions. And here I'm using the big eye of instructions, meaning how we flow and chain our agents and functions together to get the desired response. This is where a lot of the magic happens. For example, it's important to realize that not all last words should come from the AI. Once we internalize that, we can build very interesting AI flows. And this is where the machine still needs a little bit of our human touch. So how does Rust fit into that? First, I think Rust is the best language for creating robust cloud and client applications. And the opportunity is to use it to create the next generation of applications. And whether we like it or not, user expectations of what an app should be able to do have fundamentally changed. So it's better to embrace it than fight it. You can find the accent-free version of this video on my brysnow.com website, which is my enterprise consulting company I have been running for over a decade. Until next one, happy coding.